Well, we spent a number of years really traveling all over the world looking at this phenomenon, which is essentially this massive growth of a new cadre of problem solvers, uh, societal problem solvers who are trying to solve the toughest uh, problems in our society, and very often they're, they're non-governmental problem solvers. They're social enterprise, they're what we call public value innovators, they're double and triple bottom line companies, they're citizen change makers, and, and we believe they're adding literally trillions of dollars of public value to the economy. They're, you know, they're basically building apps, they're crowdfunding, they're crowdsourcing, they're finding ways of getting that mutual alignment between making a profit, but also solving a big problem. Yeah, there's, there's a number of things going on that's changed the landscape. First of all, governments uh, just don't have the budget to solve all of these problems. In the West, we're seeing big budget deficits. And in emerging markets, essentially, if you look at something like in India, to get up to the spending on healthcare spending on GDP, the government spends in per capita in Canada that would take 70 years. And India doesn't have 70 years. So you basically, government can't do it alone. People generally understand that. Citizen demands are, and expectations are going up dramatically. And so you have this, you have this gap that's increasing. You have um, a big movement among companies to look beyond the bottom line, to look beyond shareholder value, to look at what their social impact is, their environmental impact, because it's simply not rational to only look at shareholder value. And then you have this, you know, this generation of millennials um, who basically very, very clear that they want to do something beyond just making money and that they want to have a purpose and a social mission. I, I've spoken to 4,000 business school students in the last four months, 85% of them say they want to go into social innovation, something to deal with social purpose. That would have been unprecedented just a decade ago. No, I, th I think it's a combination. And that what's changed today is that there are, there's a now a social capital infrastructure. So if you have a really good idea that can both make a profit and solve a problem, and you can actually get funding for that today. There's, there's 18 different funds in India, for example, which fund social ventures right now. That's, that's really amazing. Hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars are going into India in this area. Overall, uh, we saw that impact investing is now, you know, in the tens of billions of dollars in terms of an industry. A billion dollars last year went into education startups from venture capitalists. So the, the difference is that there's actually money that you can make right now um, by solving a problem because there's a financial infrastructure, a capital market that exists that simply did not exist just a decade ago. And governments have a role to play. Um, you've got governments doing things like in the UK, the Big Society Capital Fund, which is a 600 million pound fund to invest in social enterprises. In India, you have the India's Inclusive Innovation fund, which is just starting up, which is a billion dollar fund. And they just announced in Canada, uh, one province, the province of Alberta, a billion dollar fund in this. So you do have capital now going in, which makes a big difference because you can actually um, earn a living while also solving a societal problem. Sure. So, so right now we're really at the beginning stages of of, of this revolution. If you look in India, you've seen a lot of the activity occurring really just in the last six to seven years alone. Um, and places like East Africa, you know, earlier than that. And, and so you have the most mature markets right now, I, I think in probably the US and the UK in terms of the social infrastructure. Certainly within emerging markets, India has the most mature market for these sort of ventures right now. And you have a lot of um, organizations, whether it's in healthcare or education or waste management and other areas that are scaling up fairly rapidly, going from being in one city to being in dozens of cities and so forth. And you have, you know, organizations obviously like Aravand Eye Hospital and so forth, which serves 300,000 uh, people a year. And I, I think the key thing is that if you've got a good business model, and it's working, you can, scale, you can scale that up. 
as long as there's investments there. And that's going to take investment models from business. Um, it's going to take money from government and I think some of the multilateral institutions. Because right now, I think a, lo- a number of these organizations are reaching millions, if not tens of millions of people. And the next question is, how do you get them to where they can reach hundreds of millions? And that's, that's that next scaling process uh, that needs to occur. And we, need, we do need more pioneer investors, people who are willing also to both help in financing the scaling of those ventures, but also helping in financing new ideas at the very early stage seed capital, which is needed for a lot of these organizations. Well, you know, I, I do think one of the challenges is, is the role of government here. Government can play a number of different roles in this. Government can compete against this emerging social enterprise sector, this emerging social sector, and try to basically do things themselves. They can regulate them out of existence. or They can be neutral. And I, I don't think any of those uh, models are the right model. Or what governments can do, essentially, is um, saying that this is fantastic. These organizations have the same goals in terms of creating public value, and we're going to do everything we can to facilitate the development of the solution economy and the growth of, of non-governmental problem solvers. Um, and that's, they can do that through prizes and challenges. They can do that through social innovation funds. They can do that through the procurement process. Um, they can do that by creating an env- enabling environment for these organizations uh, to both exist and to grow. And I think you know, we, we have uneven uh, strategies from governments around the world. Some of them are very, very good about this, and some of them are actually very, very poor. So governmental policies need to get right to continue this growth and to accelerate the growth. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this is my eighth book right now. And um, I I wrote a book also called Governing by Network 10 years ago in which I looked at how governments can leverage um, the social sector, private sector, and others to create more public value. The difference, the reason why we wrote this book was that we were seeing lots of problems, reducing food waste, for example, um, and other issues where government wasn't at the center anymore of these ecosystems trying to solve the problems always. So it's, it's a very different role for government. It's not a lesser role, but what it is is it's a different role. Government becomes the solution recruiter or the enabler as opposed to the doer themselves. And government's always not, not always going to be the integrator. If you look at some of the most successful models in India over the last 10 years in this area, whether it's healthcare, education, waste management, uh, water, and other areas, you have actually entrepreneurial organizations who are at the center of building these ecosystems, organizations like Husk Power and others. And then at some point, governments can play a role in terms of helping them to build that through financing and so forth. But that's a big change, that you could have these organizations developing the integrate in ecosystems around creating public value themselves. And it's a really, really great development, I think, for society in general. 